welcome to ahimsa conversation yes. uh so what is your earliest memory of either the idea or the experience of non violence i've actually never consciously thought about this but now that you're asking me this question i think the first thing that comes to my mind is that the fact that i was born in a jain family uh a family that was uh not religious in that sense somewhere there was this undercurrent of the concept of uh, i would say not just ahimsa but everything else that's related to it in the sense of uh, um you know empathy not doing harm to other human beings valuing life uh whether in all its, it's in all its forms and i think that to me now that you're asking this question that to me relates to a living constant memory of uh what we would call ahimsa i don't know if that answers your question but this is something that now i'm going to i think think much more about yeah. there's a culture of uh, you know forgiveness that one just imbibes without really actually giving it very serious thought it's a way of life yeah. can you tell us something about your education uh, what did you study and how did you come yes, to be involved uh, in the seagal foundation yes i went to art college actually and uh, i'm uh, i qualified to become a graphic designer in those days of course many this was many years back the early 80s us un dino kehte the commercial art now there's a very fancy name which i feel i always missed out on which is of visual communicator so when seagal foundation decided to launch process called peace works how did how did peace come to be defined in this process how is peace understood a definitely not as the absence of war mm-hmm. yeah uh i think the larger broader idea was to question uh where conflict comes from mm-hmm. and uh, one of the you know and there are several answers to this as you would know right but one of the common threads and the overarching umbrella i would say to this question where does conflict come from uh to us at least seems to be mindsets right mindsets that uh, we pick up as we are growing up mindsets that we don't question we just unconsciously imbibe them often we are not even aware of certain uh uh thing certain ideas and issues that are lodged in our subconscious till we are faced with you know uh, an outside um uh, situation that triggers a belief that has been there in our hearts and our minds which we are not even which we've never articulated and we're not even aware of but for peace works and history for peace born together no actually history for peace happened much 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 later uh, the philosophy uh, the overarching philosophy to put put it into one phrase is learning to live with difference so uh, whether we talk about difference religious difference whether we do, uh, talk about socio economic difference difference between peers difference between siblings um it's it you know essentially it is difference that leads to conflict in a small way or in a big way right i don't agree with your ideology you don't agree with mine and we are not being able to uh, um you know we a we're not being able to accept it and we're not even being able to respect it right um so so learning to live with difference to accept it the felt need came from the fact uh, um during the time of the 2003 communal riots uh one you know living in calcutta which is i mean you know it's in a sense we are very fortunate we don't see a lot of issues that some parts some other parts in the country do right it's not a daily reality for us over here in calcutta um 
there is greater assimilation in a certain manner, at least. Uh, and even if there isn't a, a social assimilation, there is acceptance. There is tolerance. Uh, is not the word that I like to use anymore, but I'm, in this context, I will still use it. Uh, but there is, you see, when you talk about young people, uh, children from our kind of homes, for example, right? What we would call, quote unquote, having a privileged upbringing, going to a certain kind of school, having, you know, exposure to a certain kind of protected environment. You know, it's a very protected environment. The exposure is very limited. And uh, it's not their fault. Uh, but what it does often lead to a, a, a slight sense of apathy, you know, where you know, there's this sense of, and you know, the teenage years, of course, there, there's also a lot that else that is happening during those teenage, teenage years. So, so there is a little sense, small sense of apathy, oh, that kind of a thing, you know. And it's really not, they're not to blame because we as adults, as parents, as educators, what are we doing? Are we providing the necessary exposure that leads to sensitization, right? That's, that's all that is required. They just need uh, their, their, their world to be opened up to other areas, to other worlds. And that was the felt need actually, to open up that world uh, for a certain segment of humans. So our funding ended in 2009, we are in 2020. And we, we sometimes, we also kind of get a little amazed that, oh, we're still around. And one of the things that, uh, that always comes back to us is, oh, but you are working with, with uh, a section of society that we don't deal with. This, this is you know, something that nine out of 10 grant making organizations tell us. And we say that, but that's it, you know, that's where the need is, right? I mean, it's not just about the fact that these youngsters don't have exposure. Whether we like it or not, um, the, these are the kids who go on to hold because of the privileged education that they receive and the kind of environment that they grow up in, they, they, they do have the advantage of two steps ahead. You can't deny that, right? Whether we like it or not. And they do go on to hold on to the whole positions of power. Like when you asked me the question about Ahimsa and I thought about my upbringing in a Jain family, I'm hoping that, you know, all the youngsters that we've worked with, when they, when they are in the position where they can make grants, they will think back of their exposure through these works. Yeah. Yeah. Can you just say very briefly how PeaceWorks actually functions? I have to tell you, it's very limited. Because we use, A, we use the arts. That's, that's the most important uh, uh, um, uh, aspect of the work we do. And we, uh, so when I say we use the arts, it could be literature, it could be theater, it could be film. It could be photography. It could be visual art. Any any form of art. It could be in some uh, cases. It could also be music. Uh, the essential idea behind what we do is to provoke thinking, to provoke, to inspire questioning, right? Uh, to 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 make uh, the audience that we are working with to look within themselves. Uh, <clears throat> which is something that doesn't happen in our, within our education system. It doesn't allow it because uh, we, we still, you know, of course, there are, there are there's some very, very wonderful schools that are doing great work now, but largely within our education system, we uh, actually discourage questioning. Forget about, you know, inspiring uh, questioning and encouraging it. It's actually frowned upon, right? So, so that is the area that we focus on. So we would go into schools with a project. Uh, we say we've picked identity, all right? Uh, which is one, one uh, uh, subject that, we've, uh, that I think weaves into most of what we do. So we, we've designed 
uh, an intervention around identity, which we take to schools. We could use film to explore the concept of identity with the students that we're working with. In some cases, we make it a point to use uh, theater. Uh, for example, the work that we've, we uh, did for, for a period of about six years in Kashmir, we only worked with theater because um, the need was uh, there for, for the medium, for, for a medium that would allow us, uh, you know, much deeper intervention over a period of time. When we, are, when we are doing these projects with schools, usually they, uh, they are, you know, they span over a period of, say, three days, four days, sometimes just four hours. And then we keep going back, of course. So different themes are picked up. Current events, we do a lot of work with current events. Uh, you know, say we're talking about the lynchings that have happened across the country. So we devise a module around it you, using literature perhaps. And you know, then you do the readings and then you do the discussions. So similarly with uh, uh, photography, if, because we do, we also, uh, you know, the foundation also promotes art. So if we come across uh, a particular uh, body of work of an artist that lends itself very well to talk about the issues that we like to deal with, then we would use an exhibition and uh, design a workshop around the exhibition. But we specifically do not bring our opinions into it. Because the whole no. idea is, yeah, the whole idea is that they have to arrive at their own conclusions. And that's very important. So all the interventions are designed in a very objective manner. Uh, so I'll give you one example, which, uh, you know, very recently we, uh, we um, put together a module, but this is for teachers to use in the classroom. We put together a module on all these, you know, with all the, all the best that were happening around citizenship and NRC issue and all of that. We put together a module, uh, which, um, and if you look at the module, it's, it's got, you know, we've done intense research on the topic, on the history of, uh, uh, you know, the citizenship bill and how it kind of shaped up over the years and how it culminated. And we've put every single fact into it in an interesting manner. So, so what happens is when you go, when you are going and facing your group of students, you're actually telling, you're, you're conveying information in a very non-judgmental, non-biased way. It's very difficult. I keep saying this all the time. If one has to, you know, hold back. It's really hard. And we're still learning where that is concerned because, um, you know, it's, it's I mean, it, it's a human tendency, right? Where, you know, your opinions always uh, take sense want to take center stage. So yeah, yeah but, but we, as far as possible, we try not to, uh, you know, bring our opinions into the picture at all. Uh, in all these years of working with students on the issue, different dimensions of peace and uh, non-peace, uh, have you found uh, any kind of, um, do you get a sense that most young people are taking violence for granted more than non-violence or that is there a is there a is there a feeling that non-violence is harder i think so i i think so they haven't said this in so many words but yes uh, um i do think that uh, uh, the concept of ahimsa or nonviolence is not something uh, that features in their uh, dailiness at all. My sense is that um, um, amongst the young people that we encounter, we, we, uh, I, uh, neither violence nor nonviolence actually forms 
uh, a conscious part of their vocabulary, but aggression does. And aggression, you know, without, without their actually uh, being aware of it also. And it's really not their fault, I think. It's, it's again the environment, you know, because we are looking at, uh, think about school, classrooms, right? You have classrooms with 40, 50, 60 students. Now think about playgrounds in the schools. Yeah, you, it, it's, it's how do you stop, especially young boys, you know, with all the energy that they have at the age of 11, 12, 30, 40, from not being aggressive. They're not violently aggressive. They're not visually aggressive. But it's just, it's, it becomes like almost their deep name, you know. So, so then that, and, and not, I think not addressing that uh, uh, deliberately it, it is dealing with a very volatile situation. Because that, that innocent aggression has possibilities of, you know, leading and developing into unpleasant characteristics as, you know, they grow into adults. Which so can later become violence, you're saying. It can, absolutely. It, it can, it can. Because also, you know, how, how do we define violence? It's, it's not always just the physical act of beating somebody up, right? right? There's so much more to it. There's so much more to it. And it's such a deep issue that it, it can sometimes take a lifetime to actually, actually uh, practice Nonviolence in many ways. Indeed. Particularly, you talk, talk about the emotional aspect of it, you know. Yes. So, yes. since this program is now, um, I think, about 18 years old. That's right, yes. 2003, 13, yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have any uh, kind of um, knowledge of the Students who have passed through this process, do you have any way now of mapping or knowing uh, in which ways it may have helped them, affected them? Uh, well, uh, yes, but not yet now. But give us a, give uh, us just a, 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 yeah. a sense of it. Yeah, there are, you know, there are uh, uh, a lot of them keep in touch. In fact, um, in fact, uh, the first batch, 2003, the group that um, uh, were involved in the project, um, even today, some of them we are still in touch with. And uh, even today they say that it was a line that, you know, being part of the PeaceWorks project was a life-changing experience for them. And... Um, uh, and this is something that has happened through the years. Uh, in fact, just last week, I heard somebody telling me that the History for Peace conference have been a life-changing experience for them, you know, young students at Jadavu University. So yes, those who do keep in touch, there, there are some who stay in touch, and uh, uh, we get feedback like this from them. But you know, it's but this this is the heartbreaking part of the work we do, which is something that we have to live with, that we will never know. We will never really know whether we've made any impact because it's such long-term work. Again, it's 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 exactly what you started this conversation with, where you may not have memories of ahimsa, right? Because and sometimes you have memories that only get triggered in uh, at certain points in life. So, so you know, they, I, I believe that uh, all the young youngsters that we've worked with, we will never say they 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 will probably not. You know, it's not two plus two four. You can't have an immediate kind of answer to, you know, what has this particular workshop done to me or what. This particular course that I took did to me, how did it affect me? It's something that will come back in context throughout your life. 
and so yeah but this is this is the reality heartbreaking reality but yes well i think also such work inevitably is an act of faith also absolutely and belief yes faith and belief you have to it do it also for intrinsic value yes, yes. now i, I understand also, sorry go ahead no and also there is a form of belief that there is in fact right i mean not not 100% you're not going to have the same kind of make the same impression on 100 young minds right but at but at different levels somewhere something will stay that belief is very important yeah absolutely uh, i understand that through the same process you have done some specific work with kashmiri students um That's can you talk right. about that please and say a bit more about that that uh uh i need first my heart project. yeah and also sorry do do talk about how it was possible at all with you sitting in calcutta yeah yeah oh no that that uh, you know let's say those were better times um we could um it 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 was a completely because you see that person to person contact in the work we do is crucial it's very very crucial you cannot uh, uh, you know do away without it uh, yes you can develop teaching modules and all of that but the core is the person to person contact between students so when you're saying that our work is about learning to live the difference you can't talk about learning to it's an experiential project a process right the young people that we're working with they have to experience difference what does difference mean right so when we are conducting that's that's another a uh, very important aspect of all the workshops that we uh, um, conduct and all the interventions that we do we try and bring young people from very diverse backgrounds together you know so if we are if we're working with three schools for example together connected then we make sure that the profile of all the three schools is very very different right so that's that's the easiest way to make uh, um uh, the youngsters understand what difference means and that was the core of the work that we wanted to be did in kashmir you know the, the the need over there stemmed from essentially this that um, we talking about there's so much there's so much talk in our media about you know radicalization of the kashmiri youth and they're so violent and they're this and they're that but uh, do we do we talk about their circumstances do we talk about their reality do we talk about their aspirations their desires do we talk about the fact that they have zero exposure what does india mean to them you know when they are saying go india go back to india what is this definition of india to them? have we even asked this question right these were the issues that you know one thought of and we were already working with uh, students from very diverse backgrounds and we always wanted to you know when you're talking about you run a project called peace works and you work in areas like calcutta it somehow doesn't sit well right you you want to bring in the larger pole into your practice so north east and kashmir were always uh, something that we you know it, it was always like a burning desire to work with you there because it met Uh, uh some people from civil society and found the humongous warm and welcoming response that we want our children what year was this this was in 2010 it was 2010 yes 2010 was not a very easy year for kashmir was concerned but on the ground there are people who who you know they welcome any kind of the, the, the they welcome intervention with open arms they want opportunities for their youth right so 2010 was the first project that we did and at that point it it was a, it, a very simple concept 
we would work with theater. We would conduct theater workshop over a period of 10 days. We brought 15 students, young students, from near the line of control, not from proper Srinagar. These, these, these were students who had uh, never stepped out of the valley, nine out of 10. Uh, and uh, they, you know, the, their, the, their process of education was also very sporadic with the, all, all the curfews and everything that happens. You know, when they're near the border, uh, in, in, their reality is that six months out of the year, they're not attending school. School is closed, right? So, zero export. Uh, of course, with, uh, with the coming of the internet to our country, things changed a little for the valley. Uh, as and when there was internet connectivity, they would of course have the kind of exposure that our students over here perhaps do. But uh, the reality of their life was next to zero exposure. So we would bring a group of 15 students here and we would work, we would uh, approach a school local in Calcutta. To Calcutta. In Calcutta. And they would uh, come to Calcutta. Yes, bring them to Calcutta, yes. There was one occasion where uh, uh, the project happened in Assam. Uh, there's the Assam Valley School that wanted to work uh, with us, to, uh, you know, uh, within this project. So one of the interventions happened in Assam, but otherwise uh, in Calcutta. And uh, we would conduct a theater workshop over a period of 10 days. A theme would be selected. So, you know, Say, say you, you say, uh, let's say that uh, we're talking about dreams, something as abstract as dreams. And the workshop has been designed around the theme of dreams. So, you know, starting from the dictionary definition to your personal definition to, you know, everything under the sun that you can think of, all that would be woven in. And the essential, the essential idea was not to empower them with uh, theater skills or any such thing, but through the process of theater, which is so powerful, the medium is very powerful to break barriers, right? They would, we, we would not talk about the conflict at all. We would not talk about the conflict. We just did this process through theater and the students, the participants, you know, you would see this, that on day one, they're sitting in two corners of the room. And then as the days go by, the distance is narrowing. And by the time it's the end of the project, they're weeping, they don't want to part. Right? And in that process, they're talking about their lives. You know, the students from here are talking about their lives, their aspirations, their realities. And the students from there are talking about their lives and their uh, you know, aspirations and their realities. And both are learning from each other. And in that sense uh, is where we hope the sensitization is happening for the students here. And for those who come from there, it's the much required exposure, which you know we hope does wonders to their conscience. It also, it's, you know, it. We hope that it 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 kind of serves the purpose of a breath uh, of you know fresh air, right? Meeting peers. Yes. How many years was this exercise able to happen with the Kashmiri students? Well, unfortunately, only uh, six years. The last intervention we did was 2016. In between, there was one particular intervention where we took students from here, from Calcutta to Srinagar. Um, the organization that we work with, there are two organizations that we work with over there. One of them is called the Help Foundation Jammu and Kashmir. They run, they do a huge amount of work, but one of the things that they do is they, they run three orphanages. So, so we took, uh, um, I mean, what better, a uh, way to sensitize our youth than to take them. And, you know, we, le we lived at the orphanage and we worked with the students uh, of that space. And, uh, but that was, uh, that, that was one intervention with high school students. 
And in 2016, that was the last project that we managed to do. Uh, in fact, it's a pity because that particular um, session that we had planned, the plan was to, uh, you know, there's always this, uh, this discomfort in the work we do about continuity. Because, you know, when you're working with one group of uh, young people for a period of 10 days or a period of one year, what then, what next is a question that's always there in your mind, right? You're not going to continue, be able to continuously work with them for over a long period of time. And in the in case of the Kashmir project, that was a very, very important factor. And we were very unhappy about the fact that we were, you know, being only able to work with 15 students at a time. And after that 10-day intervention, we were not being able to go back to follow up with anything or we were not being able to bring them back to follow up with anything. So we decided uh, um, to uh, work with, in 2016, the project we did was with a group of um, older youth. These were all uh, stone pelters. They all had 16, 18, 20, 25 FIRs against them. And uh, this organization, the Health Foundation, was trying to get them back. Uh, you know, get, get a semblance of normalcy in their life. And they wanted us to come and work with them. So we thought that if we were to train them, uh, do an initial training to become theater practitioners using playback theater, right? Uh, this, is, this is the form of theater that has been used extensively uh, between Israel and Palestine and in Egypt, etc. So, uh, uh, so, so we had this resource person, Ben, who's uh, done, who's, who's an expert at Payback Together, and he's done a lot of work in Palestine. He visits India every year, and he was very keen on working in Kashmir, so we tied up and we went there, and we trained this group of 18. Uh, uh, they, they were between the age of 20 and 24, and there was, they were, I mean, the response that me, it was like, you know, it, it, it still makes me, it brings tears to my eyes to think that it just all fell apart because they were so keen on taking the process back into the villages where it came from, right? What you would call silly practical problems, which become actually huge practical problems when you're trying to run a project without funding. That's the cruise, right? And so, you are not able to raise funding for uh -huh. this work? No, we, we uh, briefly for six months, we had support from the Prince Klaus Fund in the Netherlands. But that apart, we've never had uh, uh, any support for this. And uh, except from, which is the amazing part, we did, the, the reason why we managed to continue the work actually in Calcutta is because there were two schools that would come, come forward annually and support the project. So they would pay for the students, students to come from Kashmir, etc. Yes, they would, they would host them locally here mm -hmm. and bear all the expenses. So, you know, which is wonderful. But then now, of course, it's become very, very difficult. And, uh, but I do hope that sometime in the future, we will be able to pick up the threads and uh, work with them again. Uh, since when is history for peace conference happening? How many years has that been going on? Okay. This, um, again, uh, another very organic process that led to one uh, annual event, which led to an entire project. You know, we'd always, like I mentioned earlier, we were always very unhappy with the fact with, with our reach. The fact that we could only work with a small group of students at a time. Our team is also very small, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so so you know we we would scaling the project was always a challenge, right? So um, so the only answer to that you know that what do we do? How do we scale the work? Upscale the work? And the answer, the only one logical answer to that was to work with teachers. 
Now, PeaceWorks was working with teachers, but, uh, uh, you know, on a ratio, if one would talk about it, it was like, you know, 80 to 2. 80% uh, of our work was with students and 20% with teachers. So we decided that it's, you know, time to kind of uh, 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 focus a little more on working with teachers. So that was one uh, thought. The other thought was that we'd always use the arts, right? And uh, within the arts, we would bring in, in literature in. But when you talk about bias, within the school environment, where is the bias coming? Wrong. Apart from, of course, the human factor, which is as a teacher, I may be unconsciously passing on my biases to my students. But that aside, it's the history textbook, right? And the way we are teaching history. So, so, so that it was the combination of these two uh, felt needs that led to the entire idea of the History for Peace project. And when we actually first did, did the first conference, we never, we hadn't thought this far, the essential idea of history for peace, which is not, um, mind you, is not, the idea itself is not yet successful at all, but we're working towards it. It's a network for history teachers between India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. And uh, just before we launched the History for Peace project, in 2013, I've done a year-long project called Teaching Divided History. And, you know, over the years, we've been doing a lot of work with students in Pakistan. Um, up until that too was the last intervention was 2016. So teaching divided histories was, was where we had we developed an alternative arts-based module for teaching the partition. And then we had engaged teachers from Bangladesh and uh, from Pakistan. And that kind of, you know, morphed into a larger network for history for teacher uh, history teachers across the subcontinent and that's the core idea between behind the history for peace project and how do we do this we have to use the virtual platform right because uh, uh, uh 2016 seems to be like you know the uh, watershed year because that was also the last year that we had participants uh, participation from pakistan at the conference uh, we would have speakers coming from there, teachers coming from there, etc. from Bangladesh also. Um, so yeah, now we, we continue to do the annual conferences. Uh, over the last couple of years, the um, subcontinent idea has taken a little bit of a back seat because of what's happening within our country itself. You know, the, we, we pick uh, the topic of the annual conference based on what the urgent need to talk about is, right? So, so last year we, we spoke about the constitution. And this year the schedule was in August for democracy. So, uh, but yeah, the, the project itself is meant to be a network for history teachers across the subcontinent. We are developing teaching resources that use, that, that uh, combine the arts and history and uh, uh, essentially, none of us are teachers. None of us have studied history in the entire team. But essentially, what we are doing is because uh, there are teachers out there who want to bring alternative voices into their classroom. They want to bring interesting material into their classroom. But they simply don't have the time or the mind space to do all the research, right? So that's the work we do for them. And we put put it together into teaching resources, ready-made resources that they can just download and take into their classrooms. In what way is the whole process oriented uh, right. to encourage or to make peace seem possible at least? Right. Uh, one word, addressing mindset. Two words, addressing mindset. Addressing mindsets, right? Right. Address, recognizing bias, um, which automatically then leads to the overarching aim of respecting difference. Mm. Right. Right. Excellent. And 
the moment you do respect difference you 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 know this this whole concept of ahimsa uh, i think just becomes a way of being isn't it yes so so that's uh, uh, so we we don't consciously talk about violence or non violence but we very consciously develop all our projects with uh uh the issue of addressing mindsets in mind that's right. which are the root of it all uh, earlier root this year it. you did a course on gandhi and non violence i think it was uh, in january perhaps that right. where, yes. where did that Fun. fit into your larger frame uh again yes that the uh, this this comes under the umbrella where you know where our attempt at teaching developing alternative teaching modules because you see um going back to that discomfort of addressing small numbers even if we are working with teachers when we are working with students we are not doing a workshop with more than 30 35 people uh, students right which applies to teachers too when we are wor- do, conducting workshops for teachers we are not taking in more than 30 30 to 35 teachers our conferences are not accommodating more than 100 teachers so what where is the scale so if you are going to arm the teacher with material that uh, uh, you know helps our cause that's one way of scaling up right so 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 this this particular course on gandhi and non violence fits under that umbrella the ammunition that we are building for the teachers for us the need of the education system is defined with, through our own personal ideology what we think should be taught to students right the educators may or may not agree with us so is it an <laughs> ideology or is it a value system it's a value structure isn't it uh, i mean i think yes because you are pro- peace is not an ideology it's a, it's a value it's a moral value it's a value it's a value and it it needs to be a way of life no just yes. like non ahimsa needs to be a way of life out of all these many years of rich experience what are some of the uh doable uh inspirations you know that you can share with people at large that people can do wherever they are whatever they are doing i mean what are some of the key um poss- potentialities and uh, creative possibilities that you've uncovered yeah if you're a parent the one thing i would say very strongly please 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 encourage children to question question every single thing that they see around them that's one um the second thing is exposure give them as much exposure as you can i mean you know we have a natural tendency of being very protective you know, one of the questions that all, we always get asked by teachers that we work with oh but you know this film clipping that you have used in your module is so violent can we bring are they are they not too young to bring violence into the classroom but but it's there all around them are, are are children today not watching television are they not looking at the newspapers are they not on the internet better part of their free time so so what are we talking about so this is the first thing that we want to tell all adults you know we this is a misconception of being protective you're not protecting them you're harming them so as much enlightened exposure as possible you know conversations exposure coupled with conversations so that there is a meaningful understanding that they develop as they grow up thank you so much thank you rajini